everyone. Welcome to what is the 59th Roundtable Workshop. And uh, we're, uh, today, of course, we have Frank Delaglio, who is uh, willing to present us uh, a talk on actually using NMR pipe, and which this will be the first of two, the second one on December 14th. So John is not able to be here today, but I would like to pass things to a message that he left to us. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be, and uh, welcome to yet another Ivan workshop. Also wanted to mention that, uh, uh, as uh, most of you know, that all of the, just about all of the uh, Ivan meetings uh, uh, are on uh, YouTube uh, videos, and you can access through those through the uh, MR Resources uh, Ivan channel. There are 70 plus Ivan videos, and uh, please do take a look uh, if you uh, enjoy the material. Uh, as they say, hit like and uh, please, please subscribe to the channel. That uh, uh, certainly uh, is uh, is very helpful. Uh, so with that, I'll turn things over to Frank and we can get started. Thanks very much to the Ivan organizers for this chance to speak with you all today about the details of spectral processing with NMR pipe. Now, we've had several, dare I say, dynamic and interesting talks about non-uniform sampling and the methods of spectral reconstruction. Today's talk is going to be full of tedious detail and small angle X-ray scattering setup, and of course, access to the National Neutron Scattering Facility at the NIST campus, which unfortunately is closed right now. Anyway, I mention that because if any of this work is interesting to folks who are looking for postdoctoral opportunities, this is a lovely place to come and work. So the software that we're going to present today, NMR Pipe, has been in development for more than 20 years, and lots of folks have made excellent contributions to the software. I'm great, uh, grateful to all of them, and several of these folks are actually on the call today. Now, NMR Pipe, first and foremost, is built and continued as a tool to support the computational work in the laboratories where I work. But we do what we can to make these tools available to everybody in the community. Now, the software was initiated to support the work of multidimensional NMR in the Structural Biology Laboratory. But over the course of years, it was also adapted for commercial purposes such as ligand screening in a pharmaceutical company, vaccine quality control, and analysis of uh, food and metabolomics mixtures. So we can see some examples of those different things today. The software has an immense learning curve and the low level details are obscure. So the best tools for learning the software besides discussions like this or to inspect the various demonstration data sets that we have with individual scripts that will go through the entire collection of steps required to convert raw data to NMR pipe format, convert NMR pipe format data to a process spectrum, and to perform whatever analysis is appropriate for the result. So we're gonna see examples of these kinds of things. And in particular, we're gonna begin with typical workflows in NMR pipe for processing both conventional and non-uniformly sampled data. This slide gives us a list of the typical tasks in processing and analyzing NMR data. And all of these facilities are available within NMR pipe. And we will see examples of all of these things today and at the next Ivan discussion, which is devoted to analysis. Now, just as a reminder, in a typical multidimensional application, we start with time domain data like this, which consists of a series of one dimensional measurements. And to convert that data into a spectrum. First, we Fourier transform all the rows of this data, and then Fourier transform the columns 
or vectors from whatever remaining dimension there are, and that generates our multidimensional spectrum. And as we've discussed many times in the past, one of the adjustments to this kind of data acquisition scheme is the adjustment of non-uniform sampling, where we skip measurement of some fraction of the 1D increments that we measure in a multidimensional experiment. And this results in spectral data that has gaps in it, such that when we Fourier transform the dimensions with gaps, we get spectra that have in, intense reconstruction artifacts, uh, which is not suitable. We can't generate good spectra in this way. So we need a mathematical way to fill in the blanks in order to generate a good spectrum. And as we've discussed in previous presentations, and as we'll see today, the mathematical methods that we use to fill in the blanks of non-uniformly sampled spectra can also be applied to conventional spectra in the same way that we might use linear prediction to extrapolate data and increase the apparent resolution. For a given dimension, in order to perform Fourier processing, we generally apply some kind of window function and scaling of the first point in the time domain data. We perform zero fill to at least double the size of the original data. We perform the phase correction and Fourier transform. We can perform these sometimes in reverse order, but these are the basic steps and every dimension of a multi-dimensional spectrum gets these functions applied. Now, the NMR pipe processing engine adopts two concepts from the Unix computer operating system. And these are concepts called filters and pipelines. In Unix, a filter is some program that reads some kind of input, modifies it in some way, and then produces an output. So for example, Unix has a command called sort that sorts text in alphabetical order. So the input is a collection of lines of text and the output is a collection of those same lines of text, but reordered in alphabetical order. So this idea of a filter, we can extend to spectral processing functions. For example, a function that applies a Fourier transform and its input is the time domain data and its output is the Fourier transform data. And diagrammatically, we can think of it as something like this. So we can imagine a stream of data vectors moving through this filter program and emerging as Fourier transform vectors. So that's the first idea, the idea of a filter. The second idea that we take advantage of is the idea of a pipeline. This is a collection of programs connected together so that the output of one program is used automatically as the input to the next program in the series. And with this simple idea, we can rearrange filter programs that perform individual processing steps like a window function or a zero fill or a Fourier transform and connect them together in a sequence so that we can achieve more complicated processing schemes. So for example, we can imagine one filter program that can apply a window function and another filter program that can apply a Fourier transform. And then we can join them together with pipelines so that we have a stream of data emerging from one application that applies the window function, the next application that applies the Fourier transform and so on. So this is what it looks like in diagrammatic form. And this is the terrifying appearance of what it looks like in a Unix shell script. But if you look at this, what you see is at the beginning, we read input from time domain data. At the end, we write output to a spectrum. And in between, we apply different processing functions. This vertical bar is the Unix pipeline symbol. It means one program is connected to the next. So what you see here is one long command with three instances of NMR pipe 
all operating simultaneously, one to read the spectral data, one to apply the window function, one to apply the Fourier transform and write the result out. And so a steep part of the learning curve with NMR pipe is to become familiar with these processing functions and what the various command line arguments they have uh, do and how to manipulate them. And I'll show a little later how you can get lists of these things and figure out uh, more about what these different parameters mean and how to set them. So in addition to the basic functions for window functions, zero fill for a transform, there's some other common functions like solvent filters, linear prediction, the Hilbert transform, which is an important function that replaces imaginary data that was previously deleted. Uh, we have a function to extract a particular region of the data and a function to perform various kinds of baseline correction. So those are the principal functions. And- Frank, there is yes. a question of, about, there's a question about um, scaling. Um, Gonzalo, if you are on the line, just go ahead and ask. The question is, what is the reason for scaling the first fit point? What yes, is the I reason for scaling the first point? That is an awesome question. Uh, let's see. So if you don't mind, I'm going to see if I can find some slides that will explain this a little bit. So NMR data is discreetly sampled, right? And one particular point in the NMR data represents an interval separated uh, with that point in the middle, okay? So this is not so unusual. So each one of these points is the center of an interval. What that means though, if you think of the meaning of the first point, this first point is centered at an interval that only half actually exists at uh, t greater than zero. So really only half the interval is measured here. And so in point of fact, when we apply a discrete Fourier transform to this data, the first point is counted twice for all intents and purposes, because it's really a half increment, but it's treated like all of the other points as a full increment. And so the simple remedy for this is to scale the first point by half. And uh, in the discussions, we'll see the examples and what the outcome of this first point scaling is. Now, this only applies when the first measured point is at t equals zero. And if that first measure point is somewhere else, because there's a delay in uh, the acquisition of the first points, then it's not appropriate to scale the data. Now, whenever there's an acquisition delay, it means there's a first order phase correction. So the rule of thumb is when there's no first order phase correction applied to the data, you scale the first point by half. And we'll see in a little while what the outcome of doing this correctly or incorrectly is. Uh, does that make some sense? Yes, thank you. Very good. It's a nice question. Mm -hmm. So to return to where we were, we have this idea of filter programs that we can connect together to perform all the steps of processing a particular dimension. And to apply this to multidimensional data, all we need is one program that can start at the beginning of a pipeline and read data vectors from any dimension of a multidimensional input to send them down a pipeline to be processed. And another program at the end of the pipeline that can collect the process data and write them out to a multidimensional output. And we can say process a three-dimensional data by first processing all the vectors in one dimension, 
then the next dimension, and then finally the third dimension. And we can do different things like insert transpose functions so that we can process two or more dimensions simultaneously. Now, there are a few interesting things about these schemes. First of all, as we'll see, all of these schemes are built with ordinary Unix shell scripts. So whatever tools you use to create and modify such shell scripts, we can use to create and modify processing schemes. The other thing is that when these schemes are actually running on a computer, all of these individual functions are separate programs that are running independently in parallel. So there's a degree of parallel processing that you get automatically as an outcome of using a pipeline scheme. Now, here is what the under the hood processing scheme for a three dimensional data set looks like. And of course, especially for folks who have never even edited a Unix shell script, this is terrifying. <laughs> it's full of obscure details and lots of parameters that have to be adjusted by hand, including, for example, whether or not you scale the first point of the given dimension by half or one, phase correction values, the PPM limits for a region that you'd like to extract. In this case, it's amide detected data. So we just extract an amide region. So all of these details, it is terrifying, but it's incredibly flexible as well. And not only is this script a complete record of all the steps you took to convert raw data into a spectrum, but it's actually the tool that you use to convert the raw data into a spectrum. And so this is an excellent tool for reproducibility because you have the all the details that you need to get back the spectrum that you generated previously. And now a message from our sponsor, MR Resources. Uh, MR Resources into uh, 38 or 39 years at uh, this point and uh, offering uh, reconditioned NMR spectrometers, uh, system relocations, uh, quench recovery. Uh, they also have a uh, very nicely uh, and fully equipped uh, probe shop uh, can take care of any and all repairs on uh, uh, both room temperature probes and uh, cryo probes, as well as uh, uh, cryo platforms. Now, in addition to these terrifying scripts, we have different graphical interfaces in the NMR pipe environment that will help us to choose processing parameters interactively and even to build these scripts automatically so that it's possible to process 1D, 2D, 3D, 4D data without the need to actually create and edit these scripts by hand. And that's what we're going to see today to start with. And in particular, we're going to see our NMR Draw graphical program and its spectral processing window shown here. And we'll see applications for 1D, 2D, 3D, and depending on time, maybe even 4D. So before we actually see software demonstrations, I'm going to talk about a few important details of spectral processing that are good to keep in mind because they'll make a little more sense. And the processing schemes that we're going to use are generated in the background by a series of functions that automatically generate an NMR pipe processing scheme. And these functions are called basic FT2, basic FT3, and so on. Uh, they have an extensive set of default parameters. And in practice, what they let us do is specify a minimal set of processing parameters. In this case, the phase correction we want to use and the region of interest that we care about. And this one line automatically generates the corresponding processing scheme with solvent filters inserted automatically, 
first point scaling in the time domain, inserted automatically, baseline correction, inserted automatically, if it's appropriate for the data. And very easy to make modifications to the processing scheme's capabilities just with small changes to the command line arguments. So here's a command that processes a complete 3D data set. And we specify phase correction parameters, a region of interest, and phase correction parameters for the indirect dimension. If we want to add linear prediction or, oh, if we want to add automated phase correction, we replace the phase correction value with the word auto. If we'd like to add linear prediction, we put in some linear prediction options such that this command takes the place of this complicated processing scheme. Uh, and we've talked about this in previous processing lectures, uh, all the details of applying linear prediction to two dimensions of a three-dimensional data set. We want to do it in such a way that whenever we apply linear prediction to a given dimension, that the other dimensions have already been Fourier transformed, which localizes the signals and makes the remaining dimension as uh, simple as possible. So in a scheme like this, we have to process the first two dimensions of the data, linear predict and process the third dimension of the data, and then go back and inverse process linear predict and reprocess the second dimension of the data. So it's a complicated processing scheme, but one command will generate it completely. Excuse me. Now, as we mentioned before, non-uniform sampling methods fill in gaps in the time domain data. They do the equivalent of filling in gaps. So as an alternative to linear prediction, we can use non-uniform sampling reconstruction methods to fill in the blanks at the end of the time domain data in the same way that linear prediction does. And we call this NUS zero filling. And to use it, we just add this argument and specify the reconstruction method that we'd like to use, like NMR pipes IST, HMS IST, and SMILE. And this is another reason why NMR pipe can be a valuable tool Many of the folks who develop new processing methods like SMILE or HMSIST develop them to be used in the context of NMR pipe because NMR pipe, the pipeline scheme, makes it very easy for other folks to develop their own processing functions. And those functions just fit in like another filter in the pipeline chain. And we can use SMILE, IST, HMS, IST. And the processing of NUS data is very similar. We just have different sets of functions that we can use. Now, all of this is very obscure, but we're going to see the graphical interface that makes this substantially easier. All right, so let's look at this example of a 2D proton nitrogen experiment. When it's correctly processed, it looks like this. All the peaks are blue, which means they're positive. They're nicely phased across the entire chemical shift range. But there are details as to how you get a spectrum like this that we have to be mindful of when we generate processing schemes. And probably the most common thing that we have to adjust manually is how the sign, the relative signs of real and imaginary data are handled. And the reason for this is that different pulse sequences use different methods to alternate between real and imaginary increments in the indirect dimensions. And depending on how those are arranged, the expected relationship where the real part is supposed to be a cosine term 
and the imaginary part is supposed to be a minus sign term, these values don't always turn out that way. And so we have to apply some sign adjustment to the Fourier transform in order to get the spectrum to turn out properly. So for example, if you Fourier transform data and see that the indirect dimension is reversed, that means that the imaginary part of the data needs to be negated before Fourier transform. And we'll have a processing option that lets us do that. Another common issue is that there are pulse sequences that are arranged so that what would normally be at the center of a spectrum is instead rotated to the edges. And this in part is a way to put artifacts in places uh, where the peaks are not, okay? And this kind of reorganization corresponds to alternating the sign of every other point in the time domain data. Some pulse sequences have this sign adjustment built into them. Some pulse sequences don't. So when we see a case like this, where the center of a given dimension has been rotated to the edges, we know that the Fourier transform needs to have the sign of points alternated before Fourier transform. And so we're gonna see situations where we have to do that adjustment. And so this will help you to identify the case. So look at this spectrum, this result of processing. And if you have to look at it and make a rough guess as to what the nature of the phase correction needed in the indirect dimension, well, I would look at this and say, this is probably a 90 degree phase correction needed here because all of the peaks are positive and negative and they're negative on the bottom, red, and positive on the top, blue, and that holds for all the peaks everywhere. So they all have about a 90 degree phase distortion. So let's look at another case. How about this case? What kind of phase correction would you expect? Well, the peaks at the bottom are negative on top and positive on bottom, but the peaks at the top are the opposite. You know what? Let's just get into software demonstrations and this stuff will make a lot more sense. And let's see, we got some chat. Oh, that was first point scaling. Okay. So I'm going to start by looking at a two dimensional proton nitrogen experiment on a small protein. And as we mentioned, every stage of conversion and processing is performed with a Unix shell script that does the work. And so we usually use one graphical interface to create the script that converts raw data from the spectrometer into NMR pipe format, and then other tools to generate processing scripts that will convert that data into a spectrum. This is data acquired on one of our Bruker spectrometers. So to convert the spectral data to NMR pipe format, I use a conversion utility called Bruker. And in its simplest form, all I do is read the parameters and this tool creates a conversion script that can be saved on the disk and executed. As we're going to see later, we can also generate these conversion scripts without the need to use an interactive interface. But to start with, let's use the interactive interface. And in the interactive interface, I'm going to turn on this checkbox here that says, run NMR draw in process mode after conversion. And now I'll save this conversion script and execute it. And it'll convert the data to NMR pipe format and then start the NMR draw program in process mode. 
So what we have here is the time domain data. Here's the processing window with parameters for the directly detected dimension, which in this case is Hn, and indirect dimension, which in this case is nitrogen, okay? And command panel at the top has various menus. All the things that we can do interactively with the mouse are under the mouse menu. So if I press and hold the right mouse button, I can select different options, like for example, viewing 1D horizontal traces from the data. This gives me a cursor and I'm dragging with the mouse right now to get 1D vectors from different places in this data. Now, there are a couple of things that are worth noting for those of you who might never have used MR Draw before. One thing is that when the mouse is active, if you look at the top border of the program, it will tell you what the left, middle, and right most mouse buttons do. And generally, the mouse buttons will perform one set of actions when the mouse pointer is inside the spectral drawing area and a different set of actions when the mouse pointer is outside in the border where the axis is drawn. So for example, according to this message, the mouse pointer, the middle mouse button, will let me change the vertical scale of the 1D data, and the right mouse button will let me change the vertical offset of the 1D data. And you'll notice as I drag with the left mouse button to select different 1D slices, the location of the 1D slice in the command panel updates accordingly. And now if I want to, I can type with the keyboard and go to a particular slice, like slice number one, or I can use the carrot buttons to increment or decrement the slice number. And we'll see other kinds of slice viewing later. Now we can do different kinds of interactive processing. We'll see that under the processing window, there are things that will let us execute individual NMR pipe processing functions or to execute predefined processing functions that will convert the spectral data into a spectrum, and we'll see examples of interactive phasing. But instead of doing any of that, let's go directly to this processing interface. And this is going to automatically build processing schemes for our spectral data. And so I start by generating a script by using this button here, update script. And that's gonna create a spectral processing script based on whatever parameters are set here. And if I want to see the script, I can use the button edit script. And here's what the terrifying NMR pipe shell script looks like. We can edit it directly if we want to. And I can execute this script to generate a spectrum. Okay, so here's the result. And there are two things that I see. One is that the peaks are not phased, right? They're positive on one side and negative on the other. And Frank, there is a question. There is a yes. question by yeah, Ryan. Yeah, what's the case. question? Ryan, go ahead. Hey, Frank, Unmute how do you phone. bring up that processing, that left processing uh, section if you start NMR draw without using Varian or Brooker first? That's a great question. And as a reminder, when you create the processing schemes with this option, it inserts a comment in, in the processing scheme that shows you what options you need to make that happen. And there are two things that you need. You need this argument process that turns on process mode, and you have to explicitly name the FID, the time domain data that you want to process. So I could just as well start this by saying NMR draw process minus FID test FID. 
And there we go. Thank you. Sure thing. It's a good question. Thank you, Ryan. So uh, to get back to this data, one thing that we notice is that case that we discussed uh, previously, which is that the center of the spectrum is rotated to the edges. And so when we see that in an indirect dimension, it means we need a sign alternated Fourier transform. So I'll go to the processing window, to the part of the window for the indirect dimension, and do the checkbox that says rotate the two halves of the data. Sign, that's the sign alternation option. And also, I'm going to turn on auto phasing for the directly detected dimension. So now I will update the script according to these new changes. And if we look at this script now, we can see a couple of things. One is that the Fourier transform that's being applied in the indirect dimension has this sign alternation option inserted. And the other is that the script has a function that performs auto phasing and then inserts the result uh, phase correction value into the processing script. So all of this is created automatically. We don't have to modify it or look at it if we don't want to. Then all we need to do is just execute the script The auto phasing calculation is going on now. And here's our process spectrum, and it's beautiful, right? It's beautiful. And very quickly, we'll see more details of this, but we can do peak detection really quick. And we've gone to uh, from raw data to finished spectrum with just a few button clicks. And now for a message from our sponsor, Q1 Instruments. Q1 is dedicated to developing NMR systems from 400 to 600, as well as full system upgrades from 300 to 600 as well. You can get a lot of features in a two-channel NMR spectrometer at a great price. So we invite you to get to know more. Contact us at q1americas.com or info at q1americas.com by email. Thank you. I'm going to demonstrate some other options for linear prediction and extrapolation by non-uniform sampling. But in practice, this data is so nice and sharp that extending it by linear prediction or other methods is not really going to help things too much. So what I'll do, is I'm going to use a little script that I built already that takes the original time domain data, which has 128 complex points, and truncates it so that it only has two, 32 points in the indirect dimension. So here's our truncated version of the data. And so I'll create a processing script for it and execute it. And we'll see the same things that we saw before this Indirect dimension needs the center rotated to the edges, and we'll turn auto phasing on and update the script. And there's our process version. So, did I hear a question? Okay. Um, so, Let's see what we can do to sharpen this truncated data. Uh, one of the things that I'll do is turn on linear prediction in the indirect dimension just with this checkbox. And there are linear prediction options that we can set, including the linear prediction order and whether or not the linear prediction is mixed forward, backward, and so on. So again, I'll update the script. And if we actually looked at it, what we would see is that at the beginning of the processing for the indirect dimension, there's now a linear prediction function inserted in the script. But let's just execute the script and have a look at the result. And now we can see the spectra 
is greatly sharpened in the indirect dimension. So that works really well. And we turn linear prediction off and go back to our original broad version of the data. So let's use a different method now. Instead of using linear prediction, let's use IST to extrapolate this data instead of linear prediction. So I'll select that extrapolation mode here, create a new script and execute it. And here's a version of the data that's extrapolated with IST instead of linear prediction. And the larger the number of dimensions in the data, the more of an advantage you generally get from using these NUS reconstruction methods instead of linear prediction. So that is basic processing of 2D data. Let's look at a 3D case. There is a question. Yes. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, what's the question? My, Michael Bunstein. Michael, you want to unmute and ask the question or? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Frank, hi there. Um, so the question is, you, you're doing a linear prediction in the Y dimension. And I noticed that you didn't uh, do zero filling. Or the, I guess there's one. Well, there's one level of zero filling. So, uh, do those predicted points that zero fill uh, the LP points? Do those go those go into the into the zero filled um, points? Uh, did I say it clearly enough? I think I understand. So let's look at the script together. I'll just quickly uh, recreate it. I guess the question is, do you need at least one zero fill for the LP yes. point? Yes, so it's an, it is an awesome question. And so I will address it here. However many time domain points that you have, you should always at least double them by zero fill. Um, and the reason for this is that by convention, even though we measure complex data, we usually only analyze the real part of the result, right? And so if we don't zero fill the data at least once, we're losing half of the signal that we measured. When you zero fill, that redundantly mixes all of the real and imaginary time domain points that you measured so that the resulting real part of the spectrum contains all of the information that was in the real and imaginary part of the time domain data. Okay. So in this case, linear prediction is applied at the very beginning, and that effectively doubles the number of time domain points that the data seems to have. And after a window function is applied, we still do a zero fill. So linear prediction doubles the size of the data and zero fill is applied again. And that doubles the size of the data again. Does that make sense? It does. Thanks very much. Yep. Okay, let's see. That is, that is one more. Oh, good. That's one more question. Yes, Jane. let's hear it. Hi, Frank. Uh, great workshop. Um, maybe a more mundane question, but I was wondering, um, every time you updated your the, the processing script, is there a way to kind of uh, output different process script names out of the yeah. NMR interface so that you can kind of go back to say, say you change things, but then you, I want to go back to one that I, I liked. Right. So that is an awesome question. 
And there's a button here, settings, and that lets you do a couple of things. It lets you um, change the name of the script that performs a Fourier transform, change the name of the script that does a NUS reconstruction, and something else that you can do after, say, you set uh, particular values like we before had auto phasing turned on and rotating the two halves. And I'll turn on linear prediction too. Okay. So in the settings, one of the things we can do is save this collection of parameters, whatever they are. And next time we start NMR draw, we can start it and have it read these parameters, either from the command line or inside here. So I'll start NMR pipe again, and under settings, I'll read that set of parameters that we um, just saved previously. And now we see P0 is set back to order, uh, auto rather, we have this uh, rotate halves for a transform option checked, and we have the linear prediction option checked. Okay, does that uh, answer the question? Oh yeah, that, that's great. Thanks so much. Great question. Thank you. Anything else before we go on to look at some 3D data? I think in the chat box. All right. We're going to look at a 3D HNCO. This is data measured on a variant spectrometer. So we use the variant conversion interface. And like before, we read the parameters from the parameter file. Uh, we can run NMR draw in process mode after the conversion. So we're going to save this conversion script and execute it. And here we have the first plane of the 3D time domain data. And now the processing window has sections for the three dimensions of the data, which in this case is HN for amide, CO for the carbonyl dimension, and N15 for the nitrogen dimension. And now we have options uh, in linear prediction for both the y-axis and z-axis and options to perform extrapolations by non-uniform sampling instead. Okay. So without changing anything, I'm going to create a script with the update script button and execute the script without doing anything. Any setting of parameters. And to start with, I get a view of the 3D data. This is a plane in the interior, plane number 26. And what I'm doing now is scrolling with the mouse button to move from one plane to the next in this data, which you can do and it's, it's useful in some ways, but a better way to view the result of a 3D transform to get an idea of whether processing was successful is to use these buttons that will show 2D projections. Mm. Excuse me. So this shows the projection in the XY dimension, which in this case is proton and carbon. This shows the projection in the XZ dimension, which is proton and nitrogen. And there are two things I can see. One thing, actually three things I can see. So the proton dimension needs a phase correction. The nitrogen dimension seems okay. The carbonyl dimension needs a phase correction too. So let's see what we can do. I will start with trying to put automated phase correction in the indirect dimension and see if that improves things. So now I do this, this is the XY plane. So it looks nicely phased in the directly detected dimension. And it looks pretty well phased in the nitrogen dimension. 
The dimension that is not well phased is the carbonium dimension. And when I look at it, I see that peaks at the bottom are out of phase such that they're negative at the top and positive at the bottom. But the peaks up the top are almost all positive. What that means is there's some kind of first order phase correction that's needed in the indirect dimension. And usually, um, if you see that there's a first order phase correction needed, you can hope that this is a sign that the folks who set up the experiment uh, knew what they're doing, and they set it up in such a way that the initial delay in this indirect dimension was half a point, which means that the first order phase correction is exactly 180 degrees in this indirect dimension. So I'm going to choose that <clears throat> from the menu, update the script, and execute the script. And now here's the X, Y projection, and that looks beautiful. It's nicely phased now. And the X, Z projection is there. It's nicely phased. And so now that the data is reasonably phased, we can press this button here, which will automatically generate a simple strip plot of the data. And what this does is it allows us to see um, peaks in all three dimensions across the entire extent of the data. And the data that we just created is in blue. This stuff in pink is a result that I had already laying around previously. So this is an excellent way for me to scan through the entire spectrum and tell that the peaks everywhere are nicely phased. Now, here's a little caveat about setting up the indirect dimensions of a multidimensional experiment. So I'm going to set the indirect dimension phase correction to zero again and redo this processing so that we get a result that's not properly phase corrected in the carbonyl dimension. Okay, so here's the 2D projection. Suppose we want to interactively phase correct this. and We didn't really know what the true first order phase correction value should be. So I'm going to do that by going to the mouse menu and extracting 1D vectors from the directly uh, indirect dimension like this. So let's say, I don't know, we'll... Look at this 1D vector here. And now under the 1D menu, I'm going to use a command called append 1D. That's going to keep this 1D slice on the screen so that I can go elsewhere and look at as many other 1D slices as I want in order to process this data. In order to interactively choose first order phase correction, a convenient way to do this is by use of a phase pivot. And we do that by using the left mouse button and move it to point to a peak. So it may be hard to see, but there are little arrows on either side of the screen that show where the phase pivot is. And I'm going to point to a given peak that's on the screen. And then I'm going to adjust the zero order phase with the sliders here until this peak where the pivot is pointing is correctly phased. And then I'm going to adjust the P1 slider so that every other part of the spectrum is phased as well as possible. Now, this looks pretty good to me. What do you think, right? But look at the phase correction values. We know that the correct phase correction, first order phase correction, should be about 180. But when we do it by eye, we get a value of 160. 
And so one of the warnings about this is that it can be very difficult to choose first order phase corrections in the indirect dimensions of a multidimensional data set, especially for cases where the peaks in the data have mixed sign, positive and negative. And so this is one of several motivations to always set up the indirect dimensions of your measurements so that they have a well-tuned initial increment delay uh, so that the first order phase correction is either 0, 180, or 360, corresponding to no delay, half a point delay, or a full point delay. Uh, is there a question? Hi, Frank. It's Gerard Kroon. Hello. I I think with the face correction that we were showing, if you want, the best way to do it would be to go to both extremes of your spectrum. So if you would go down to 185, PPM, put that a pivot point, phase it with P0, and then go up to 170, phase that with the P1, everything else in between should be okay. Yeah, that's why- If you why start we... somewhere in the middle, it won't work. Yeah, that's why we are able to, that's why we set it up so that you can view many different 1Ds, so you can view signals from the different mm -hmm. extremes of the data. So one here, for example, and just like you say, at the edge, one here. Um, but in this case, it turns out that these peaks at the edge are supposed to be negative, <laughs> not positive. So if you try to phase them all positive, it won't work. But you can tell from the initial phase because they have the opposite from the other ones, right? Yeah. So... In this case, we have a nice just distribution of peaks across the spectrum that makes phase correction relatively easy to do, but not every data set is set up that way. Uh, generally, data sets are set up so that most of the peaks of interest are in the center of the chemical shift range, which makes it difficult to choose first order phase correction parameters. Um, you are absolutely right to point out that the best way to do this is to look at slices that have signals at both extremes of the data. Frank, this is Krish. Um, what, how does it do um, on the acquired dimension? It seems to be your auto phase seems to work pretty good in the acquired dimension. Why is the indirect difficult? Why is the indirect dimension difficult? The indirect dimension is difficult because it's not really sampled in time the same way that the directly detected dimension is. Um, it's generated by a series of pulses and delays. And you have to set up the timing. But fundamentally, we are assuming a linear error right i mean that's pretty much what we are doing in the in after the ft we are assuming a linear across the spectrum and that that uh first order may be zero but but in the direct dimension we are assuming linear and that it does pretty good job indirect what if we are assuming still we are assuming linear why do we need to have 180 or a 90 or a zero to be to do it right? Uh, that's I, a, I still can't understand that. Okay, um, that it's that is a, a great question, and it's practically the topic of a lecture on its own. Okay. The short version of the story is. It's related to our uh, detail of first point scaling and what the meaning of the first point is. So since you asked, we're going to go into a little digression and see if we can 
answer this in a little bit better way for you. All right. So if you look at the discrete Fourier transform, the data that we're trying to Fourier transform is multiplied by a Fourier term. And that Fourier term corresponds to a real part that's a cosine term and an imaginary part that's a sine term. And to generate one point in the data, it's the sum of all the points in the other domain times this Fourier term. So for the first point in the time domain, that corresponds to putting a zero here and here. So in practice, it's the data that we're trying to transform times the cosine of zero, which is one. So basically, the first point in the time domain is the sum of all the points in the frequency domain. And so changing the height of the first point in the time domain is equivalent to adding or subtracting a constant in the corresponding data. And we've seen this uh, in our previous lectures where we talk about the mechanism of the Fourier transform. Another side effect of Fourier math is that a shift in one dimension corresponds to multiplying the other dimension by a complex exponential. That's the phase, how the phase correction is applied. And when this delay is zero, it means that the first order phase correction is zero. When this delay is half a point, it means the first order phase correction is minus 180 because it's a half of two pi. And if this delay is a, an entire point, it means the first, the first order phase correction is 360, 2 pi. Okay. Now, as we discussed, the first point in the time domain data is equal to a zero frequency signal, a flat line in the corresponding spectrum. And the second point in the time domain data corresponds to adding a cosine wave of one cycle to the corresponding spectrum. The third point in the time domain corresponds to adding a cosine with two cycles into the corresponding spectrum. So it's an unusual way to think about the problem or the, the relationship between time domain data and frequency domain data. But <clears throat> each point in the time domain is the equivalent of adding a higher order Fourier term in the corresponding spectrum. And so if you mess up 0.2 or 3 or higher, that adds curvature into the corresponding spectrum. If you mess up the first point, all it does is add or subtract an offset, a constant in the corresponding data. If we have a phase correction of other than half a point, we wind up distorting 0.2 or higher, and that results in a curvature of the corresponding spectrum that we generate. So no matter what the situation, if there's a first order phase correction other than 180 or 360, the result has some kind of curvature in the baseline. It might be small. Does that help at all, Krish? Yeah, yeah. I'll take it off offline later. Okay. <laughs> I just right. don't understand the difference between why it is more difficult to do in indirect 
sanity. To it's not more. No, no, it's not. It is not more difficult at all. Okay, that answers it's, my question. Okay. What What's difficult is judging it by eye. Fair enough. Fair Especially enough. in a spectrum that has mixtures of positive and negative peaks, and possibly folded peaks that change sign. And actually, this is another point. So, folded signals. If there's no fir first order phase correction, folded signals have the same sign as the original signal. If there's a first order phase correction of 180, the folded signals will be advanced by 180 uh, every time they're folded, which means they'll be negated, right? So we have peaks that are either uh, that are perfectly positive or perfectly negative. So let, let's uh, update the script to show that case. So these are folded peaks and they're negative because as they fold, their phase uh, increments by 180. If there's something other then 180, like let's say there's a 45 degree first order phase correction. When the peak gets folded, its phase will be incremented by 45 degrees, which means it you'll never be able to phase it relative to the rest of the data. So this is a, another reason why in the indirect dimension, um, having non-standard first order phase corrections can be problematic. It distorts folded peaks. It introduces curvature into the baseline. All right, let's see, where were we? Uh, okay, we've processed this 3D data. We've looked at strips. Actually, I wanna clear out the results that we had there already and start from scratch. All right, let's get back to where we were. Okay, so this dimension process nicely, this dimension process nicely, these two indirect dimensions looking good, and we've seen how we can view strips of the processed result. Oh, these are still there. Oh, why is that? Okay, so let's do some other things with this data. Now that we Fourier transformed it, let's make a version with linear prediction applied to the indirect dimensions. And so I'll update the script. And here's the monster script that processes the first two dimensions, linear predicts and processes the third dimension, then inverse transforms, linear predicts, and processes the third dimension. All of those steps. So let's execute those and have a look at the results. There seems to be a follow-up in the chat. Okay. Um, by Gray. What What is the qu question? Or I'm, unmute I'm, and ask I'm, it. Okay. Yes, please. Great. Uh, hi. So when you clicked on the facing options in the indirect dimension, there are only certain combinations of faces. So I was wondering whether those are the ones uh, we have to use in reality. Right. So that's a great question. And uh, 
those are just the common ones in the menu. You can type any kind of numbers that you want in these uh, entries for where the phase correction values go. So no, you're not limited as to what phase corrections you can apply. But generally speaking, in the indirect dimensions, you, the experiment should have been set up so that the indirect phase correction values are in, ones that are in this menu. Okay, does that answer the question? So most of our faces will fit into this set you have already have in there. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. But if we if have a look, if we interactively change the phase correction value, the values in the processing window get updated accordingly. Yes, so yeah. If yeah. you want to set your own phase correction value, either interactively on the screen with the sliders or just by entering a number, you can do it that way. Sounds good. Thank you. Good question. Thanks. Okay. So we've processed our data with linear prediction. And here's what the 2D projection looks like now. And maybe if you remember what it looked like before, you can see that the lines are a little sharper in both the nitrogen and carbonyl dimension. But another way to see that is to draw the strip plot again. <clears throat> and this time we have our original data, which is the Fourier transform data next to the linear predicted data. So you can see that in both dimensions, uh, carbonyl and uh, nitrogen, the line shapes have been improved. So let's try a different method now. Instead of doing linear prediction, let's use SMILE to extrapolate the data. I'll update the script and execute it now. So which prediction would you suggest as the best one? I mean, I know that NMR IST, but in, for nosies, I have also seen it with artifacts, right? Right. So this is an, this is an excellent question. This is an excellent question. And we covered these details in our discussions about non-uniform sampling. Um, so the critical thing to keep in mind is that however you do the measurement, the number of increments that you need in a given dimension has to be sufficient to describe the largest number of signals that you expect in the data. For example, uh, if you had a 2D NOE spectrum and the most crowded column had 30 peaks in it, it wouldn't be suitable to measure that data with just 16 increments, right? Because 16 points is not enough to define 30 different NMR signals. And so people are, are often not aware of this and get into trouble when they apply non-uniform sampling to NOE spectra and other spectra that are expected to be very crowded. So in most cases that I've seen, the problem with reconstructing NOE data is not the method, it's the fact that the particular non-uniform sampling scheme that was used for the data doesn't have sufficient number of increments to reconstruct all of the signals in the data. That said, um, in terms of which methods you're most likely to have the best results with, for triple resonance style spectra, where the dynamic range is relatively limited and overlap is moderate, SMILE is hands down usually the best approach. 
And it's super fast too. So it's easy to get a result and inspect it. Smile is not as strong for data that are heavily overlapped. And so in those cases, I commonly find that one of the IST methods gives the best spectral result, um, but they're much slower than SMILE is. So for data of this complexity, SMILE works beautifully. We'll look at some other cases where IST gives a better result. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, what were we doing? Oh, yes, all right. So we process this whole thing with SMILE. Let's look at the results. So now when we look at the strips, we have the original Fourier transform version, the linear prediction version that we made, and the new SMILE version. So they're all pretty reasonable. I would say that the SMILE version is a little bit better and a little narrower, but they're all quite usable. So very easy, just a few clicks, and we can get a 3D reconstruction. That includes the latest methods for extrapolation and processing. So pretty nice. And we have a mechanism to um, evaluate different processing schemes and see the results side by side in a strip view. So let's see what this looks like for non-uniformly sampled data instead. Let's see. All right, I like this spectrum, so we'll have a look at this. This is the processing window for non-uniformly sampled data. So it has several more options and the workflow that we use for non-uniformly sampled data is that first we use regular Fourier transform schemes to settle on phase correction parameters and Fourier transform options. And then we do a non-uniform reconstruction using a method like IST or SMILE. So let's see what that works. Just as before, I'm gonna begin by creating a script using this update script button. And now I'm gonna execute a regular Fourier transform. So the button execute FT. And now I'll look at the XY projection and the XZ projection. And I can see a couple of things. So one is that in the Z axis, the two halves of the data are rotated to the edges. So I want to change that Fourier transform option. And the directly detected dimension needs phase correction. So I'll turn on that auto phasing in the directly detected dimension. And now I'll update the script again and execute a regular Fourier transform. And now we can look at the XY projection again. And the regular Fourier transform isn't perfect, but it's usually good enough to get a reasonable view of the spectrum and test that phase correction parameters are okay and that Fourier transform options are okay. So this looks pretty well phased in the XY dimension. And if I look at the XZ projection, that looks okay too. Um, except, let's see, this is uh, 
an H alpha H beta experiment. So I would expect most of the chemical shifts to be up here rather than down here. So I think this dimension is reversed as well. So I'll check that here and update our script and execute a Fourier transform. And now we got our XY projection that looks nice and our XZ projection that also looks pretty nice. And now that we have phase corrections and Fourier transform options set properly, I'll choose a NUS reconstruction method and I'm gonna choose SMILE because it's nice and fast. And this kind of data is perfect for it. I will update the corresponding scripts. And now instead of executing the Fourier transform option, I'll execute the non-uniformly sampled option. Okay, and so here's our result. I'm scrolling through planes, but we can now look at the XY projection, and that is beautiful, and also the XZ projection, and that is likewise beautiful, and now we can look at strips too. And so here's, here's an overview of our 3D non-uniformly sampled result. So with it, just a couple of clicks and button presses, we can reconstruct this non-uniformly sampled data using the best available reconstruction methods. Now, if you're interested in non-uniform sampling, but haven't been able to try it yourself, NMR pipe has one more processing option. And this is an option that takes conventional data and allows you to resample it as if it's non-uniformly sampled data. And so in this little option, what I'm going to do is use a tool in NMR pipe to make a few crude uniformly random sampling schedules at 50% density, 25% density, and 12% density. And then I'm going to run NMR draw in this resampling mode, which lets us take a conventional data set and resample it according to a given non-uniform sampling schedule. So here's the processing window in NUS resampling mode. And to start with, we can select the non-uniformly sampled schedule that we'd like to use. And so I'll start with the 50% version. And now I'll update the scripts and execute a regular Fourier transform and try to get the parameters right. So X, Y, we got this. X, Z, we got this. Y, Z, we got this. So it looks like all we might need is a phase correction in the directly detected dimension. So let's try that. Uh, 
Okay. Oh, no, actually, this looks like it might need a first order phase correction. And then in the XZ dimension, that seems to be okay. So let's have a look at this. Let's just add a little bit of zero order phase correction to this and see how it goes. Not perfect. I don't remember what I did here. Yeah, but just a little zero order phase correction. Okay, I think now finally I'm happy with this processing scheme. Yes, nice. X, Y, and X, Z all look good. Okay, so we have parameters set for this conventional data. So now what I'm going to do is select a reconstruction method, smile again, and update the scripts. And now I'm going to execute the non-uniformly sampled reconstruction. But the FID is going to be resampled according to this mask. So let's do that. Oh, I'm sorry. No wonder why the mask is uniform. I'm using the uh, uniform sampling schedule. So this reconstruction corresponds to just using smile extrapolation on conventional data. Okay, and that looks very nice. So now I'll go back and choose that 50% sampling schedule. and execute the NUS reconstruction. So the data have been resampled according to the 50% sampling schedule, and now it's being reconstructed by SMILE. And if you want to see, Here's the sampling schedule. These are the different planes of the sampling schedule. So the blue parts are samples that were kept. The black parts are samples that were skipped. And so here's the 2D projection of the NUS reconstruction. And they look very nice. We look at strips. And they look very good. Oh, there's some previous results in there. Okay, good. 
And now, instead of the 50% schedule, let's try again with the 25% schedule. So now the data have been resampled according to the 25% sampling schedule, and they're being reconstructed by SMILE. And if we look at these pro projections, they're still pretty nice. X, Y, and X, Z. And if we look at the strips, here's the 25% and the 50% side by side. 25% is in red. So it has a, a bit more noise, slightly more artifacts, but it's still quite usable. Now let's try the 12% schedule. And now let's look at those strips. Well, actually, first let's look at projections. So now the projections are a good deal noisier. Let's see what the strips look like. Yeah, so now at 12.5% sampling, there's substantial artifacts in the reconstructions. So with uh, a tool like this, you can figure out that uh, for a data of this complexity and signal to noise, 50% sampling is okay. 25% uh, sampling is probably okay, but less than that isn't. So this helps you make a decision like this and decide whether or not in future you should run this particular experiment with non-uniformly sampled measurement or not. Okay, um, I was gonna talk about 1D applications and some other things, but we actually um, spent quite a bit of time just covering these 2D and 3D examples, and we only have 15 uh, minutes together. So I think I'm gonna stop now and see if there are any questions or discussion that folks would like to conduct. That's a question by uh, Ryan. Go ahead. Hey Frank, is uh, is Smile part of NI uh, NMR Pipe, or do you have to go uh, do those separate installation files? That's a great question. So I will share my screen once more, and let's. Type NMR pipe install to find the NMR pipe installation page. And over here is a list of the different files that you would download. Okay. And also, um, you can use commands from the command line to download these instead of uh, downloading them interactively. But what we have at this page, besides the NMR pipe install files themselves, we have links to Smile. So this uh, link to Smile is actually a file that's at the NIH, but everything you need is presented right here. So it is a separate download, but you don't have to go somewhere else to get it. Thanks, Frank. Yep, good question. Thank you, Ryan. There are a couple of questions in the chat box. Okay. Uh, Phil on Mac draw, you know, I draw on, on a Mac. Yes, okay. On, so on the 
the best option for using NMR Draw on a Mac is to use a VMware Fusion virtual machine. Um, Mac disallowed 32-bit applications, and NMR Draw is a 32-bit application, so it won't work on um, Mac OS X as it stands right now. We do have, uh, uh, so we, we have a, a question about updating NMR pipe to 64 bits. On the Linux side, um, and actually even on the Mac side, we have 64-bit versions of NMR pipe. Uh, and on the Linux side, we have a 64-bit version of NMR draw already now too. <clears throat> the only 64-bit application that we're missing is a 64-bit version of NMR Draw for Mac. We have one under development, and the uh, VMware Virtual Machine actually works better and faster than native versions of the software on a Mac. And the Mac is kind of a, it's kind of problematic, not really a good environment for reproducible computing, even though it's a very nice environment for day-to-day -day use. And the reason why it's not a good environment for reproducible computing is that they regularly break back compatibility. Ah, and someone else is making a note in the chat. Another, another very useful tool in getting around uh, reliance on one particular operating system or another is to use NMR Box. And we've heard about NMR Box in presentations here before. Okay, anything else? I, 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 I know I have asked this privately with you before um, on ARM system and a mod type. Yes. So, chip. Um, right now, we do also have beta test versions of NMR pipe compiled for Mac OS on ARM computers. So, yeah, we have versions of those, and uh, we're in the process of making a Linux ARM version of NMR pipe so we can use it on a virtual machine on a Mac ARM system. Hi, Frank. What, what types of data input formats are supported? I saw Brooker and Varian. Are there others? Uh, yeah, we have conversion for uh, uh, JEOL Delta format, and that conversion is very nice. It's more or less completely automated. And we have conversion for the um, the format used on analysis spectrometers. And then we have general purpose data conversion tools to convert binary or text data into NMR pipe format. So. Uh, with the various generic conversion tools, we can pretty much take any kind of NMR data and get it into NMR pipe. Um, previously, we've had conversion examples for <laughs> uh, GE data, for those of you who uh, remember such things, <laughs> and uh, for chem magnetics data as well. So um, over the years, we've, we've made conversion schemes for pretty much all of the NMR vendors that you're likely to encounter. Thanks. Grace, you want to ask your question? Uh, I was wondering about peaks that are folded in this graphics. Uh, is there an easy way to fix that? I know how to do it, but. Uh, fix it in what way? like add a statement in a simple way or right so it's it's an intriguing question but let's think about it for a, a minute i wish i had a, a nice example to to show you okay so um here's a, a spectrum that we looked at before and these two peaks are folded from the other side, so they're negative, all right? But let me see, can I, I should be able to annotate, right? 
Okay. So we have two folded peaks here, and we can tell they're folded because they're negative. This dimension has a 180 degree first order phase correction, which means every time peak folds from one edge to the other, its phase get incremented by 180. Now, we could also have unfolded peaks that are right here at the same position as these folded peaks. Okay, so there's pretty much no way to treat the spectrum and do something with these peaks, which are folded, that wouldn't also change these peaks, which are not folded. So there are things that you could do when you generate a peak table of this data. You could identify these peaks as folded because they're negative and uh, add one sweep width or subtract one sweep width to their chemical shift position. But there's not too much that you can do to the spectral data to move the folded peaks into different positions without also moving unfolded peaks. Does that make any sense? Yes, yeah. But generally, the peaks that are folded, like you have on the screen, can be um, dealt with by doing a complete left shift or right shift of the spectrum, you know. Yes, but they that also shifts yes. the unfolded peaks. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Hey, Frank. This is Gonzalo again. Yes. Um, I'm still thinking about the, the first point scaling. Does, okay. does it have the, the first point scaling? Does it have any impact on the quantitation uh, of a spectrum? Yes, it does, because it's equivalent to adding or subtracting a constant to the corresponding data. So let's see if I can show an example. It's a little bit on the extreme side, but here. This is a particular case where if you scale this indirect, indirect dimension. You are, not, point, you are not sharing your screen. Uh, I'm not sharing the screen again. Silly me. Sorry, guys. So here's a rather extreme example of what happens when you fail to scale the first point correctly. So here's a, a plane from a, a three-dimensional data set where the, this indirect dimension has had the first time domain point scaled by half. And if you process this data without that scaling, it adds a constant offset into the corresponding spectrum. So that corres it corresponds to a, a zero-order baseline distortion that's as big, uh, that's proportionally big as the intensities of the peaks. Okay. So yes, it very definitely affects quantification if you don't scale this first point correctly. However, if you do any kind of baseline correction right. after the Fourier transform, that has the effect of potentially fixing this uh, incorrect processing. Right, but, but it's proportional to the to the to the size of the peak, right? That's correct. So the baseline correction will just move everything basically uh, from, from Yeah. Since separate time. baseline corrections are applied to every right. one-dimensional vector, the different right. vectors <clears throat> will get different amounts of baseline correction applied. Uh so if it's a good baseline correction uh method, this spectrum will be correctly uh, compensated. Well, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you all for participating today and for your many interesting questions. You're always welcome to write to me directly if you have questions or discussion. And I look forward to seeing folks in two weeks when we talk about analysis of spectral data. And if there are particular analysis details that you're interested in, feel free to write to me directly before the presentation in two weeks, 
and I'll try to include such details in the presentation. Thank you all so much. And thank you, thank you. Rish and David and MR Resources. And thank you, Frank. Uh, it was wonderful. Um, hope to see everyone two weeks from now.